got no way I'm going There ain't, ain't got no way Ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord No, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord No, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord No there ain't, ain't got no way, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it. So now, let me just share some information with you about our guest as we welcome him into the program. His name is Kenneth Conkin, and his story begins mostly in 1970, while a junior in Cornell University's College of Engineering, he broke his neck making a tackle on a kickoff in a lightweight football game against Columbia University. He sustained a spinal cord injury at the C4-5 level, rendering him a quadriplegic, almost totally paralyzed from the shoulders down. Hmm. While still a patient, can testify before a United, United States Senate Subcommittee on Healthcare, chaired by Senator Edward Kennedy in 1971 almost 20 years before the Americans with Disabilities Act. He returned to Cornell campus where he completed his undergraduate degree in industrial engineering. And he estimated that he had to be pulled up a bounce down close to 100 steps just to attend his first day of classes. Hmm. Amazing. Ken also is an author, and he published a book in October of 2023 entitled Ken's Memoir, I Dream of Things That Never Were, The Ken Conking Story. And there's so much more. Uh, he boasts about his marriage to his beautiful wife, Anna, and he's the proud father of triplet boys, Joey, Jimmy, and Timmy. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest live on Breaking Out of Depression. As you see a picture, a headshot of him here on the top right-hand corner on my side, Kenneth Conken. Welcome to the program, Ken. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. It's nice to have you and we appreciate your time, your commitment, and we appreciate you for being here. Kenneth, let me begin by saying that I am amazed by the level of resilience and the strength of your desire to accomplish so much, even after it seemed as though your life was put on hold because of that terrible accident that you had. And I commend you for that. And I'm sure that so many around you would appreciate the fact that you have been a driving inspiration because of the decision you made to still make something out of your life. If you had the opportunity to speak to the entire world, let's say you had a megaphone and you were to tell them about your story, let's say in about three or five minutes, how would you describe it in terms of the passion and the desire that you had to get up from where you were and achieve something that many thought would have been impossible. How did you do it? How would you describe it? Thank you. Well, I think the first way I would start to describe it is by saying I had a lot of help, a lot of help every step of the way from right. my incredible family and some very close and helpful friends because I couldn't have done any of it without their help, love, encouragement, and support. Right. I'm paralyzed almost all of my body. Hmm. And basically, my family and friends assured me that they would act as my arms and legs to give me the opportunity to do everything I want to do with my life. 
And with that encouragement and support, it got to the point where I knew I couldn't let them down. I had to do as much with my life and try as hard as I could because they were pushing so hard to help me in every way that they could. But there's another thing that I would like to comment on. Sure. And that's also that it's so important for people to keep their expectations high when they're dealing with somebody with a disability, or quite yeah. frankly, when they're dealing with almost anybody, whether it be a family member, a friend, an employee, whatever the, the situation. Because when I was injured, I felt like the medical profession had such limited expectations for what I would be able to do with my life. And I saw so many patients in the hospital while I was there who were not doing much with their lives. And one of the reasons I think that was happening was because everybody's expectations for them were so limited. Mm. When I was in the hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, it seemed like the medical profession thought the best I would ever be able to do would be to sell magazine subscriptions over the telephone. Mm -hmm. Now, I was determined to do more than that. That's why I returned to school when I did, and I got my degree in industrial engineering, as you mentioned. But I decided that really engineering didn't seem like a viable field for me. This mm -hmm. was well before the time of laptop computers. Yeah. In fact, even dialing the telephone back then, they were rotary telephones. I couldn't even dial the telephone. But with everybody's help and support, I decided that what be, would be a better career goal for me was to go into a career in counseling where I could help other people who were dealing with, whether they be disabilities or life-altering diseases, because I really wanted to give them better help, care, and support than I felt were available to me when I was undergoing my rehabilitation. Yeah. So I continued my education at Cornell and I earned a Master of Arts degree in Counseling and Student Personnel Administration. And then to increase my counseling credentials, I went to Columbia University where I obtained a second graduate degree, a Master of Education in Psychological Counseling and Rehabilitation. And I was very fortunate after a lengthy period of looking for a job to be hired by an organization on Long Island in New York called Abilities Incorporated, which was part of what was then called the Human Resources Center and is now called the Viscardi Center. And they hired me to work as a vocational rehabilitation counselor for other individuals who had disabilities. And that made an enormous difference in my life. The fact that they gave me the opportunity to show what I could do and gave me the opportunity to work and earn a living, it, it made all the difference in the world to my self-esteem and my self-confidence. And I can't thank them enough for that opportunity. Wow. What an amazing and inspiring story and indeed as you speak, I can feel and hear the passion in your voice, Ken. And I, I am still in awe of the fact that you pursued and you pursued and you pursued until you reached at a point where you became employable, which is a challenge for so many people with even all their attributes. So <laughs> hats off to you. What Thank you. And as I said, yes. when you say became employable, even when I felt I was employable, it was a challenge convincing employers yeah. to give me the opportunity mm -hmm. to show that I could work. And that still holds true for so many individuals with disabilities. Just give them the opportunity and they will surprise so many people. Yeah. How would you describe the mindset that you had to pursue and to just achieve and accomplish I know you said you had the support of your family and wonderful friends, and that, of course, would have been a catalyst in so many ways for the foundation upon which you would have strove and striven to the point where you are now. But what kind of mindset would you tell people that takes to get to that place, to actually believe that you can accomplish despite the setbacks, despite your challenges? 
You know, when I talked about keeping expectations high, that doesn't only just apply about your expectations for others. It applies to your expectations for yourself. Yeah, so, yeah. You've got to believe that you can do it. You can't just listen to naysayers and people that are telling you it's just too difficult or that you shouldn't even try it because it's so hard. You've got to have the desire, the will, the motivation to say, I can do this. Just give me the chance to show you. And fortunately at the Scotty Center, they gave me that opportunity. And then they helped me find the best physical adaptations and accommodations to help me function even better than I thought I'd be able to function in an, in an office. And, you know, there's a, a little cartoon that I saw once that, I, that I've always liked. And it shows a pussycat looking in the mirror and seeing himself as a lion. And that's how you need to feel about yourself. You yeah. need to look in the mirror and feel like you're looking at a lion who can accomplish anything you set your mind to. Wow. Indeed, that, that's a wonderful philosophy. And a, a better way to see yourself than many others that people would have probably wanted you to. So in terms of you making this positive impact on people's lives, what it is like when you are before a crowd and you are inspiring folks, you're reaching out to them and you're telling your story from your place of reality. What is the emotional content that you feel coming from the room and also for yourself? Well, it's an incredible feeling. You know, before I was injured, I always considered myself a bit of an introvert. I never wanted to speak up in front of a crowd or draw attention to myself. In fact, in class, I would try and sit in the very back row, off to the corner, never raise my hand, and hope I still just blended in with the crowd. And suddenly, here I was, following my injury, being asked to speak before. I was injured. I didn't know of any other role models that I could look to and say, you know what, somebody with my type of injury could go out and do certain things and to work and earn a living. There may have been people out there, but I didn't know about them or see them. And I got to the point where I was thinking, you know what, maybe I could be that role model for people. Maybe I could show them they don't have to be the first to try something. It's been done before. And that there's an awful lot someone with a disability can do. And not just in an entry level position, you know, I worked as a coordinator of a program when I worked at the Viscardi Center, and I gained so much self-confidence that I left my job there and went to law school. <laughs> and after graduating from law school, I was hired as an assistant district attorney here in Long Island. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the district attorney at the time was a very progressive, self-confident individual who based his hiring decision on my abilities rather than my disability. Uh, he wow. hired me to work as an assistant district attorney. I had never heard of an assistant district attorney who was a quadriplegic going to the courtroom, actually trying cases. And now I hope that maybe because I have done it, other people will see that as an example and decide there's a lot they can do with their own lives. And in fact, I didn't just work as an assistant district attorney as a line assistant. I was promoted a number of times where I became a deputy bureau chief and I was helped supervise more than 25 other assistant district attorneys. And I would like to add that at my job, when you'd leave the job, you'd go through an exit interview where you would talk about what you liked best about the job, what you thought could be improved about the job, and I must say that on a number of occasions, the person conducting the interviews said to me that a number of ADAs said the best part of their job was meeting, getting to know, and working with me. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't say that to boast or brag. I'm saying that because they were referring to meeting, getting to know, and working with somebody who had a serious disability. Yeah. Because other than perhaps a family member, 
most people never had close contact yeah. on a daily basis with somebody with a disability. And I think they found that an enormous learning experience for them. And I think they were very pleased to see it didn't mean any additional work for them on their part. Wow. Yes. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. So we are in the presence of a gentleman who has overcome disabilities to the extent that he has made endearing changes and achievements in his career, much like the guy that I showed you in the video. Remember, you can put your comments and you can ask your questions in the chat. And I'm sure Kenneth would only be too happy to respond to them. I want to give him time to take a break and I want to share with us the thought of the week. Uh, if the producer can put it up there, we're going to share this with you and we're going to get back to speak with Kenneth. We're going to look at his publication. The thought for the week is believe in ourselves or belief in ourselves rather is the key to opportunity. But faith in God is the doorway to success. I repeat, Belief in ourselves is the key to opportunity, but faith in God is the doorway to success. I hope that drops some nugget of faith and hope in your spirit and you continue to have positive engagements with regards to the thought of the week. So we just want to ask Kenneth about the publication. Why was he, uh, I should say, engaged in such a way that he thought it was important to write the publication. And how did he come up with the title? Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> um, when, when I, this, you can see the book right behind me. Yeah. Uh, I Dream of Things That Never Were. Right. In Duncan Story. As you indicated, when I was still a patient in the hospital, I was asked to testify before a United States Senate Health Subcommittee chaired by Senator Edward Kennedy. And eight days after my testimony, Senator Kennedy sent me a glass paperweight in the mail that had an inscription on it that the Senator said his late brother Robert Kennedy liked very much. Mm -hmm. And that inscription read, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream of things that never were and say why not. That's where I got the title of my book, I dream of things that never were. Because yeah. those words have always been so meaningful to me. Wow, wonderful. And how did you get the material in terms of the research and gathering all the things that you needed, the public, the, the publisher, the editor? How challenging was that for you, Kenneth? It was very challenging. You know, I actually started writing this book over 50 years ago. Wow. And I'd start and stop and start and stop. And of course, the way I was writing it would be, I would be dictating it to people. And, and you know, that always took a long time. Um, but ultimately when, um, well, let me tell you a little bit about my personal life, just to talk yeah. about, you know, I told you a bit about my schooling and a little bit about the job, but what I'm most proud of is my personal life. You mm. see, in 2003, yeah. I married the woman of my dreams. Her name is Anna. She's yes. actually sitting to my right just off camera. And we last year celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. And when Anna and I first got married, Anna said that she wanted to have my baby. Not mm. just a baby, my baby. Now, this seemed impossible. Right. At the time... I had been paralyzed for more than 30 years. Mm. And I was already in my 50s. But we looked into various options, including in vitro fertilization, and we're very excited to learn it still may be possible for someone in my condition. So we pursued in vitro, and through the miracle of science, Anna became pregnant. Mm. And I was actually present in the delivery room on January 24th, 2005, when my wife, Anna, gave birth to triplets. Wow. I have three incredible sons, Joey, Jimmy, and Timmy, yeah. who are now 19 years old, 
and in their sophomore year at three different colleges in upstate New York. <laughs> so I was able, when the boys got a little older and we had some time, Anna and I, my wife and I sat down and I would dictate to Anna what my life was like and about, and Anna would type it on her laptop computer. And we did that for hours and hours on end. And when we finally finished the book, we had trouble finding a publisher. Um, uh, you know, I tried getting a literary agent and wasn't able to find one. And finally, a good friend of mine who had published a book asked if he could show um, my uh, book proposal to his publisher. And he did. His publisher was 12 Tables Press, which is owned by Steve Eric. Mm -hmm. And he showed Steve Eric my book proposal. And Steve Eric, who usually only published books about legal issues or lawyers, decided to publish my book. While I'm a lawyer, my book really isn't about legal issues. Yeah. I mean, it does talk a little bit about my work in, at the DA's office. But he agreed to publish my book, and I'm so thankful for him to doing that. And I've gotten such nice comments on who's ever read the book so far. Yeah. And if you want to purchase the book, you can go to my website, KenKunkin.com, and it'll indicate there how to purchase the book, which, as most people probably would go to, it's available on Amazon. And I've gotten such nice comments. I'm so glad that I was able to put it in writing. Because when people heard my story, when I'd speak at different events, they were saying that I should really write a book so it could get a wider audience. And with everybody's encouragement, I decided to complete my story, complete it in writing. And I'm so proud of the book that's been published. Yes, indeed. What a wonderful story. So the producer has put up your family's picture, that wonderful picture there on my left, which is on your right on the right. screen, and also the cover for your amazing book. We have a, a, another individual in, the, well, she's, one of our more popular and regular supporters, Grace Douglas. And I just want to shout out her pleasant night to the panel. God bless with a heart and a hand of greeting. We welcome you, Grace Douglas, and thank you for your continued commitment and your support. So Kenneth, I'm looking at your story and I'm really, as I said before, truly fascinated is there a spiritual aspect to your life? And if so, how important is that for you as well in terms of the challenges that you faced and the decisions that you made about your life and yourself going forward? Well, you know, for a long time, because I couldn't move, I was lying in bed and people told me to try and keep faith. And what I found was that nothing is going to just happen to you by lying there without you taking the initiative. Yeah. I found it's so important for you to participate in, in life in general and get back into society. Um, and I learned that good things don't just come to you without you working for them. And I decided that it was important for me to get out there and do as much as I can to make, you know, my life meaningful. When I was first injured in the hospital, I had a lot of people from all sorts of different persuasions, you know, rabbis, priests, ministers, all visiting me in the hospital. And when they would come in, I'd ask, why did I get hurt? And, and the answer, no matter what religion they were, was usually the same. Well, we can't tell you why it happened, but we can tell you that God works in mysterious ways, mm -hmm. and that God has a plan for you. And for a long time, that did not bring me much comfort. Right. But over the years, as I look back now, and I look at my incredible wife and my three beautiful, wonderful, wonderful sons, I think if God's plan was that someday I should become so disabled that I would need to meet my wife and rely on her for physical help and care. 
and then to have three incredible sons, well, then maybe it was a pretty good plan after all. <laughs> yes, indeed. Wow. And, and I love the way that I see the light in your eyes as you spoke about it lovingly and the way that would have warmed your soul and your spirit. What advice, can would you give to people who are in a similar position, who have found themselves newly as you were at that time when you were searching for answers and you were asking all those questions, but there was not much comfort given, but still look at what you have accomplished. What advice would you give someone in a similar position to you? Well, there are a number of things I would say. One, it's so important to keep up hope. You know, I found that when I was injured, I had a number of people telling me that, you know, your spinal cord was severed. There's no hope for any recovery, just accept it. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to keep up hope when that's the attitude of the yeah. people around you. Yeah. And I think it's important to keep up hope, not unrealistic hope, but hope that there's still a lot you can do. There's a lot you can do with your life if you apply yourself. Mm -hmm. And through the help of others and the help of others is so important. It makes a huge difference in your life that when you get to the point where you're able to help others, do that, take advantage of it. My first job working as a rehab counselor, I felt great because after years of receiving help, I was finally in a position to help others. And then when I went to work as an attorney, I was serving the community and helping others on a daily basis. And that made an enormous difference in how I felt about myself. And I think it's so important to tell people who are newly injured, don't lose hope. There's still a lot you can do. You may not see it now, and you're certainly gonna go through some difficult times in the future, but never lose hope. And it's so important to you take charge, not just sit back waiting for something to happen. Good things happen to you when you work for them and when you're actively involved in making it come true. Yeah, I love that, wonderful. So folks, please, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. We have the opportunity to share with Ken our thoughts, ask our questions. His story is not a usual story. It's truly an amazing and epic story. And we need to gather as much as we possibly can from it. It is really inspirational and touching. From a family perspective, Ken, your wife, Anna, your children, they have been there for you. and whatever adjustments that they had to make. They, they saw it, of course, as being worthwhile. And one I am sure that came out of love more than just being sympathetic. What advice would you give to a family who has to deal with someone who has found themselves now? I just wanna switch roles a little bit. You spoke about you and your mindset and your attitude and how you have to see things and how you have to have high expectations for yourself as well. But what about the family who has to now make the adjustments to deal with the level of disabilities that this individual may have experienced? How are they supposed to approach it? And at the same time, be of help to the individual, like your family is of help to you. You know, my family came together to help me in so many ways that it not only was a great benefit to me, I think it really made them closer as a family. Uh, it brought them together to act as a team, teamwork to help me as best they could. And growing up, my wife emphasized that with our three children, mm -hmm. that we're all a team. We need to help each other and making sure everybody gets the help and support they need to thrive and it's made our boys very close with each other as well as with us. And I think our family has been an example to others how when everybody is supportive, everybody thrives and succeeds and benefits by it. And I can't emphasize enough what the importance of family has played in my life. Yeah, indeed. Family is extremely important and I think 
that I think I know that God's original plan for mankind was that we behold the beauty of family and the value of family and embrace it with that deep level of conviction and love that he really wants us to have for each other. I'm thinking about the levels of stress that individuals go through every day. The experts would tell us, Ken, that there's good stress levels and there are negative stress levels. There's good levels of anxiety and there's negative levels of anxiety. How do you deal with your levels of stress? You know, that that's a good question, a really good question. <laughs> because I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is before my injury, one of the ways that I relieved some of the stress in my life mm -hmm. would be on the athletic field. Yeah. I would go out and work really hard, whether it be in football, running into people or, you know, doing something physical and very active. And that was a great way of relieving stress. And once I was injured, I didn't have that outlet to relieve stress. And now I need to find other ways to do that. Yeah. And some of those ways, of course, are just looking at the faces of my children or my wife. You know, I find it so comforting and relaxing. But when I can, I like to get outside and, and be in na with nature, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be sitting by the water or in a garden and just appreciating what beauty is taking place around me. And I find that and sometimes it's just a question of telling myself that, you know what, sometimes the stress and the anxiety pushes you to do even better yeah. when you're working on something. And to just try and keep it in perspective. It doesn't take over your life. Yeah. but that it helps push you to do even better with what you're trying to accomplish. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like sound advice and a level-headed approach to dealing with stress and some of the things that we face in life day to day. I'm listening to you and you're very passionate. And of course, you have shown your ability to achieve so much despite your challenges. And I'm thinking, Kenneth must have some philosophy that drives it. Is it a, a Gandhi-like philosophy? Is it a Martin Luther King Jr. philosophy? Is it an, an ancient Greek philosophy of the Aristotles or the Plato's or the Socrates? Or is it just pure Kenneth Conkin? I, I appreciate you trying to put some wonderful divine uh, thought and reason behind it. Um, but for me, it's just very basic. Uh, I'm very thankful for all the help and support my family and friends have given me. And I try to pay that back. And as I say, when I was injured, I didn't have role models that I could turn to for yeah, yeah, and encouragement. Yeah. And I would like to serve as a role model for others. So if I could help make the way easier for them, I would like to do it. And I find I feel better about myself when I'm helping others. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it reminds me of a quote that I, I very often saw and used by uh, Mahatma Gandhi when he said, the best way that you can find yourself is in giving of service to others. And that, that moved me as, as a member of Lions Clubs International is something that I always remind my people to focus on. Because we have to understand that one of the basic things that we have been given is the opportunity to be our brothers and sisters keeper. And for me personally, Kenneth, there's, there's no boundaries or barriers with regards to color, creed, race, ethnicity, religion. We're just basic human beings. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And like a famous saying, why can't we all just get along? But it's not an ideal world, <laughs> unfortunately. So we have to deal with the challenges that we are facing day to day. So folks, we are with Kenneth Conkin, making the most of a bad situation. This is the title of the episode 
and we thank you for your continued commitment and support as we continue to build and develop and grow this community here on breaking out of depression. And I feel like the moment has arrived for me to repeat the thought of the week one more time again. So I'll ask our producer to put it up just to remind us that we have our limitations, but there's no limits to what God can do in our lives, but he needs us to do something as well. The thought of the week. Are you there, Dexter? Yeah, he's there. Taught for the week. Here we go. Belief in ourselves is the key to opportunity, but faith in God is the doorway to success. Belief in ourselves is the key to opportunity, but faith in God is the doorway to success. I love that. So, Ken, I want to imagine that you have an opportunity to speak to the leaders of this world, the earthly leaders, whether it be presidents or prime ministers or those who are in charge of countries, continents, people. We have so many challenges that we see happening in the world today. It's, it's very discouraging at times to even tune on the television. Not to mention the fact that Miami is <laughs> bracing for another hurricane, a category four approaching category five status. It's very depressing at times just to see what is happening in the world. And I'm sure it's a challenge for many leaders, Ken, to find the opportunity to make people feel that there's hope. But from your perspective, if you had the opportunity to say something to them, how would you frame it? How would you phrase it? Well, there are a number of different ways. One, that we always accomplish more and do more when we work together as mm -hmm. a yeah. When we're all on the same page, have the same goal, and that's to do as much good for as many people as we can. And I feel we can do that more as a group and as a team than as an individual. And to keep in mind that everybody's life is worth living and worth saving and not to disregard anybody because they may be a little more physically or intellectually limited. Everybody has a role to play. Yeah. And with everyone's help, that role can be bigger and more meaningful and more helpful for so many people. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful, wonderful. In the area where you reside currently, what's the leading football team there? Oh, well, I'm a big New York Jets fan. We have the New York Jets and the New York Giants. And uh, despite the fact that I was injured playing football, I sit by the television every Sunday glued to watching the Jets and the Giants play football. So here's the question, Ken. Why is it that... Aaron Rodgers, with all his skill and his experience, seemed to be struggling to get this offense. That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. And I think the coaches are trying to find the answer as well. But as I indicate, uh -huh. it's a team sport. Yeah. It's a team sport. Now, Aaron Rodgers, as terrific an athlete as he is, cannot do it alone. Yeah. He's got 10 other teammates on offense who need to all do their part and work together in sync as a team. And once they do that, we're going to win a lot of games. Yeah. I hope how you think they'll progress at, at this current pace. Do you think that they will find a way to gel eventually? Absolutely. I, I think they're going to go on and win every game they play. I've said that every year, of course. Uh -huh. And I feel like this year I really, really mean it. And um, I know today they made a change in their head coach. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident that they're going to move forward and have a great year. Wonderful. Great. So with regards to community, how important is community in terms of the role that community plays with someone who had your challenges or who have your challenges 
being able to see the brighter side and really believe that there's hope and that they can accomplish much more if the community around them plays a certain role. You know, when I was injured, the medical expenses were really piling up. Yeah. My community got together and had fun drives to raise mm -hmm. money to help yeah. pay for my medical expenses. Wow. And they did that here on Long Island, the Oceanside community where I live. And they also did it up at Cornell University where I was going to school. Every, even Columbia University where I was injured tried to help raise money and funds to help me get the help I needed. And everybody banded together to try and help me. And that made a big difference. And not only the way I felt having that community support, but also physically and financially being able to pay all the bills. And now, even after I left the Viscardi Center, I've been blessed that they've asked me to serve on their board of directors. Hmm. And I feel like I'm an integral part of the disabled community, yeah. trying to continue to help others who happen to have disabilities to do as much with their life as they can and to lead a useful, productive, rewarding and happy life. And I am so pleased to still be a part of that community. Yeah, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So I was just sharing before you came on a video by a gentleman and his name is Nick Visicic. Are you familiar with him? No, I'm not. Uh, this guy was born without arms and legs. And at the age of 10, he tried to commit suicide because he felt that his life was not valuable. He didn't have the opportunity like other kids to run around and play and be involved in sport and all that. But at some point in time, recognizing that the pain and the anguish his family would have to go through, after three attempts, he decided to give up. And when you look at his story and his life now, the amazing thing about it is that he has found a way to use that negative aspect of his life or what per some perceive as a negative aspect of his life to be an amazing storyteller about how he transitioned from seeing himself as a loser, as a no-gainer, as someone who couldn't fit in to someone now who is making a tremendous difference in the lives of so many. And yes, he may have a million views or so for his videos, but every time he attends a place and he tells his story, you see people crying because they feel the passion, they feel the joy of knowing that even in his position, he was able to rise from the ashes, as they say, and now he's a, a massive inspirational story for so many. How involved are you in terms of the social media platforms? Is, is there a way in which your story can come true as something that is so delightful that it can make a difference in the lives of many? Well, I, I would like to think that I can help a lot of people in many different ways. I've done uh, some motivational speaking over the years. Right. Where I've spoken before a lot of groups and organizations to yeah. try and motivate and inspire people to do more with their lives. Mm -hmm. As I indicated, uh, I'm on the Viscardi Center Board of Directors, where I have another platform to try and help and encourage people. And now yeah. on Podmatch, where mm -hmm. I'm doing this podcast now, yes. I've been on a lot of different podcasts recently as a guest to try and spread my story to let people know that you can do it that it's doable right with the proper help and support and to try and spread the word that way as well and i might add that when i worked at the viscardi center that's named after its founder dr henry viscardi jr who was born without legs wow used artificial legs prosthesis to walk around and Recently, we had the president and CEO of the center, uh, John Kemp, who left uh, recently to take a position down in Alabama at the head of another center. 
but he had been the president and CEO for years, who was also born without arms and legs and used prosthesis. And it was inspiring just to see him, listen to him, and see how he functioned on a daily basis. It, it just impressed everybody that came in contact with him, how much you can do. And going back to Dr. Viscardi, as a result of his efforts, the Viscardi Center has helped and continues to help so many different people with so many different disabilities, all as a result of Dr. Viscardi's dream and his effort to make it happen. In fact, one of the graduates of the Viscardi School, they have a school for people with handicaps and disabilities, went on and is now a district court judge here on Long Island. His name is Robert Papia. And he went through there, is parallel, you know, has muscular dystrophy, uses an electric wheelchair, and is a judge here on Long Island. Yes, 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 yes. So many possibilities, but you just got to believe. You got to believe, Ken. When you look back on your life and you think about the achievements, your, your wonderful family, Anna and the boys, does anyone stand out to you and, and really lights up your, your soul and makes you feel, ah, it's like a wild... Well, Obviously now, as you mentioned, my wife and three children, without a doubt, boy, do they stand up me every day. I love and I have to say, you know, my brother, my brother Steve, my sister Meryl, my Aunt Lorraine and Uncle Mel, my Aunt Betty, my Uncle Jay. I mean, all of my family, we are so close. Yeah. And each and every one of them, my Danish cousins, they've all helped me so much in every way. They're all like brothers and sisters to me. And they all stand out as people that I look to for encouragement. And I'm just, they just make me feel good to be around them. And, you know, my brother Steve is my best friend and always has been. And everybody just comes together, as I say, as a team. We work and help each other, and it makes all the difference. What a wonderful thing to be able to say. Thank you for sharing, Ken. Really appreciate that. So in terms of the book, is there a sequel to that memoir that you wrote? Thank you. The <laughs> sequel will be watching me live my life to its fullest. Ah, and and that they can do either in person at some of my talks or by following on, you know, whether it be social media or... Yeah other ways but that'll be my sequel wonderful have anyone approached you so to do something like uh, a mini tv series or even an, an amazing movie about your story you know thank you for for mentioning that i've had a lot of friends and relatives uh suggesting that someday that may happen but no that hasn't happened at this point <laughs> would you love to see that happen if it's done properly, yeah. you see the recognition of my family and friends for mm -hmm. all they've done for me, I yeah. would like to see them get that recognition. And wow. if either a television or a series or a movie gave them that recognition, I would like to see that. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Truly wonderful. Would you would you say that your, your writing helps you to connect with any particular style of anyone in terms of other famous writers that you have known or books that you have read over the years? Um, I, I would say that my style is, is very individual because I tried my best just to write what's happened in my life and how I felt about it. And I never considered myself a writer. I mean, my best subject was always math. I always felt that, you know, I, I would be most comfortable working with numbers and facts and figures and not actually sitting by a typewriter and writing. But I found that putting my words on paper um, has enabled me to um, get a lot, a, a much greater audience to hear what I have to say. 
and you know i i i don't know if i could compare it or liken it to anybody else other than i've tried my best to say exactly how i am feeling and what i've gone through and hope that makes an impression on people I know that at, at some times this is a really contentious topic. I've seen people put information out where they're saying that thousands of jobs are going to be replaced. And then there are others saying that's not going to happen because the AI can't have the passion and the compassion and the human element about it. What are your thoughts about the influence and the influx of AI into our world and, and what differences have you seen happening as a result of AI? You know, I'm amazed at how far we've gone technologically. Yeah. What a difference some of these advancements have made in everybody's lives, yeah. but particularly people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Now, as I indicated, when I was hurt, we, we didn't even have touch tone phones. They were rotary phones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, electric wheelchairs were antiquated. Mm -hmm. um, there have been so many changes and improvements in all sorts of technology that it's encouraging to see that there are no limits for what people can eventually do, accomplish, invent, discover. It's thrilling to be alive and to see it all happen. Yeah, wonderful. So, and there'll always be some who will see it one way and some who will see it the other we just we just can't get away from that it all depends on perspective but yes it has made such a wonderful difference in terms of the kind of progress we have seen in the world and in some ways it cuts down on the time that one would take to do the research and studies and get information that is important so they're they're, they're the good stuff the good stuff that comes out of some of these things and we can't i think the challenge ken is when i look at it i realize that we seem to want a mirror of ourselves in the technology but we have to realize that we can't replicate or duplicate ourselves despite the fact that we have all these advances in technology it is extremely important to understand that we are just human <laughs> and we need to remain that way as much as we possibly can. Well, I appreciate that every day when I know that we put a man on the moon more than 60, about 60 years ago, yeah. close to that at least, 55 yeah. years ago, and yet we still can't figure out a cure for spinal cord injury. So I know we have a long way to go to get to where I hope we'll someday be. And technology is one of the ways of doing that. Indeed, indeed. So in terms of the life that you are currently living, when you look at your three boys, I know you're extremely proud of them. Do you see them being involved in the same profession as you in any way, shape, form, or fashion? Well, right now, they're all studying different things. One of them, they're actually going to be studying mechanical engineering. Uh -huh. Now, while I studied industrial engineering, I never worked as an engineer. And yeah. I, I later went into the fields of psychology, education, and law. But he wants to be a mechanical engineer. Another one of my sons is studying renewable energy. Um, he wants to help with advancements in that field. And the third son is studying communications and journalism. Wow. So they're all studying three different fields. But you know what? I never would have thought when I was in college, I would have ended up being a trial lawyer. Mm. I mean, here I went from studying engineering to getting a degree in education and then a degree in psychology before I went to law school. So they've got plenty of time to find the best field for them and do what brings them a lot of satisfaction. Great, wonderful. And I'm sure you're really looking forward to an amazing future 
as they continue to study and achieve in their individual sections or individual choices of profession. We're coming to the end of this episode. We just have about four and a half minutes to go. And I'm still really intrigued by the success that you have accomplished and the support of your family and your friends. And you said that your brother is your best friend. That's so wonderful. What if someone has similar challenges like yours, but they can't find family and friends to really understand and support them as they need to? Is there an alternative? Are there organizations or associations that have these helplines that people can reach out to and, and get some level of commitment or support from a community to help them? Absolutely. There yeah. are a lot of uh, organizations out there for almost any type of disability. And I'm sure they could Google it and find out the appropriate support center for them. Um, I know the Viscardi Center has a lot of information on how they can help people with all different types of disabilities and they could get in touch with them as well. Um, but there are so many people out there that just want to help that, you know, you can find somebody that you trust and believe in and speak with them. And you'll find the more people that you share what you need with, the more information and help that you'll get. So there are a lot of people that, that can help with, with these areas. Um, there's no shortage of that, and especially on social media now, it's a lot easier to find the help that you need. Comforting to know. So as we're about to wrap up, I just want you to remind our viewers and those who are listening on the other social media platforms and the app, how they can get a copy of that wonderful book that you have written, that memoir. Amazon Prime, it's called, I Dream of Things That Never Were, the Ken Kunkin story. But they could also go on my website, which is kenkunkin.com, and that'll tell you the different ways that they could order the book. And in fact, if they want to order it in bulk, you know, to give as gifts, they can contact my publisher directly, and it indicates on my website how to do that. And he would be able to help them if they wanted to order it in bulk. So there you have it, folks. You know where you can go and get a copy of his amazing memoir. In about two minutes or so, we're going to wrap up, but I just need for you to tell us what would be your parting words, your parting gift, your parting statement to our audience and for those who would see the, the edited version of this show later on. Well, one is keep hope alive. It's so important to keep hope in your life. Two, to exceed expectations. Don't listen to naysayers. Believe in yourself. Believe that with, you know, the proper motivation, perseverance, determination, and when necessary, help and support from others, there's an awful lot you can do with your life to benefit yourselves as well as to help others. Get the best education you can and never stop learning. Mm -hmm. So important to participate and challenge yourself and don't be concerned about, you know, whether something is just too difficult or people saying you can't do it. What's important is what you believe you can do. Believe yeah. in yourself and go for it. I love that. That's a resounding note upon which to bring this amazing episode to an end. And as we part ways, I just want to remind Ken that I'm going to do the reviews on the Podmatch platform. And in about eight days or so, we'd have uh, edited versions, MP3 and MP4, which we'll send to you. And of course, Anna can receive that information and let you know. So you can use that for your references and continue to promote the work that you are doing and the book, of course. 
they can get it on Amazon and on your website. So we thank you, Ken, for being such an amazing and engaging and refreshing guest on this episode of Breaking Out of Depression. And we thank Dexter, our producer, and also those in the audience, Grace and Gracie, and those who are on the other platforms looking on and listening. We thank you for your continued commitment and your support. And as we leave you, we want to remind you, as we do always, whatever you do in life, do all that you can to continue to break out of depression. Until next time, this is Andy, your host, on behalf of our producer Dexter and our guest Ken Conkin saying so long, Godspeed, God bless. Bye for now. There ain't got no way, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it with them. I'm gonna know, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it with them. My Lord, no, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it with them. My Lord, no, ain't got no way I'm gonna make.